Welcome to the Flowered Path. How are you doing tonight, Justin? Good. It's good to have you back. Hopefully we can get the podcast back on track here. I've had some traveling time to do with the other podcast, and it kind of threw me off schedule. But I'm happy to get back to recording some episodes and have quite an exciting one tonight on these prophets from ancient Greece, known as the Sibyls. This is a fantastic episode you put together. How did you first come upon this information? I mean, I've always, you know, growing up, like I didn't go to high school or anything. I just kind of read whatever. And as is typically the case with homeschooled, self-educated people, like we often do a lot of reading. And so I've always been familiar with ancient literature and the symbols are something that's in there. You'll, you'll see them mentioned here and there. I'm not sure where I first heard that they prophesied Jesus, but I mean, it was something that I came across again as I was entering Catholicism, and so I decided to dig up all that I could on it for this. I was completely unaware of this until you sent me the information for it. So to me, it's all new, and it's completely fascinating, and, and I think it will be to many of our listeners as well. Before we get into it, though, I would, would like to thank two new patrons, Teresa Dorsey and Avikai Brodigam. Thank you so much for your support. If you would like to support The Flowered Path, you can go to patreon.com slash thefloweredpath. All of our patrons, no matter what tier, get commercial-free versions of the show if you're in at Rose or Orchid tier, they also get bonus content, and Orchid tier gets monthly merch mailings as well. But I want to thank all of our patrons. They help us make the flowered path. Thank you so much. something I do think that is important to specify is that these are not the oracles that most people might be familiar with. So like the oracle at Delphi that said Socrates is the wisest man. That's the most famous one. These are not the same thing. These are actually more ancient than that. And they're prophesying largely ended sometime a bit before Socrates. So they're, they're not the same thing. These are very specific prophets, and there was about 10 of them. In ancient Greece, extending to a time before Socrates, there were prophets known as the Sibyls who prophesied in song and lyric. They sat in caves and swamps away from civilization. They were frequently consulted on military and government matters, where they prophesied the results of military action and the fate of Rome. There were only ten Sibyls identified by the holy sites they prophesied in. They were highly revered. The Sibyls spoke in a frenzied state, perhaps ecstatic. Some were said to be immortal or Methuselian. The Sibyl, with frenzied mouth, uttering things not to be laughed at, unadorned and unperfumed, yet reaches to a thousand years with her voice by aid of the god. The Cumian Sibyl lived in a cave in a volcanous region of Italy, full of sounds from the earth and vapors arising from ground vents. There she wrote her prophecies on oak leaves, which may scatter in the wind at any moment to be lost. When the hero Aeneas of Virgil's Aeneid visited the Sibyl, she gave Aeneas a tour of the underworld. The Cumian Sibyl was an old, ancient, decrepit woman. As Aeneas and the Sibyl pursued their way back to earth, he said to her, whether thou be a goddess or a mortal beloved by the gods, by me thou shalt always be held in reverence. When I reach the upper air, I will cause a temple to be built to thy honor, and will myself bring offerings. I am no goddess, said the Sibyl. I have no claim to sacrifice or offering. I am mortal. Yet if I could have accepted the love of Apollo, I might have been immortal. He promised me the fulfillment of my wish if I would consent to be his. I took a handful of sand and holding it forth, said, Grant me to see as many birthdays as there are sand grains in my hand. Unluckily, I forgot to ask for enduring youth. 
This also he would have granted, could I have accepted his love. But offended at my refusal, he allowed me to grow old. My youth and youthful strength fled long ago. I have lived seven hundred years, and to equal the number of the sand grains, I have still to see three hundred springs and three hundred harvests. My body shrinks up as years increase, and in time I shall be lost to sight. But my voice will remain, and future ages will respect my sayings. The thing that stands out to me about that section is there's an element of, you know, when I talk about these paranormal things on the other podcast on Strange Familiars, I give it a general name of the other just because generally we don't know what these things are. It's just a sort of a catch-all term. But it always seems like when people make these deals with the other, whatever it is, there's always this sort of catch. You know, unless you dot all your I's and cross all your T's, they're going to throw something in there to mess up the deal for you. When I read that, you know, grant me to see as many birthdays as there are sand grains in my hand. Well, she gets that, but it, she doesn't ask for youth. It very much feels like, you know, that's a deal from the other. That's the kind of deals they give people, which is a word of caution. Yes, no deals with the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This passage here is directly from Virgil. The story of the acquisition of the Sibylline books by Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the semi-legendary last king of the Roman kingdom, or Tarquinius Priscus, is one of the famous mythic elements of Roman history. Centuries ago, concurrent with the 50th Olympiad, not long before the expulsion of Rome's kings, an old woman who was not native of the country arrived incognita in Rome. She offered nine books of prophecies to King Tarquin for purchase. The king laughed at her, finding the books and their high price, and the old lady to be ridiculous. The old lady promptly threw three of the books into a nearby fire, and offered the remaining six books for the same high price as the original nine. The king found her to be absurd, and again declined the books. The old lady then threw three more books into the fire, and gave the same high offer. King Tarquin then relented, and purchased the last three at the full original price, whereupon she disappeared from among men. The books were then kept in the Temple of Jupiter, on the Capitoline Hill in Rome, to be consulted only in emergencies. The temple burned down in the 80s BC, and the books with it, necessitating a recollection of the Sibylline prophecies from all parts of the empire. These were carefully sorted, and those determined to be legitimate were saved in the rebuilt temple. Emperor Augustus had them moved to the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill, where they remain for most of the remaining imperial period. The Sibyls are depicted in three Catholic masterpieces, the Deus Aere, the Sistine Chapel, and the Apocalyptic Song of the Sibyl. The Deus Aere reads, Deus Aere, Deus Ila, Solvet Seclum in Favila, Teste David cum Sibylla, that is, the day of wrath, that dreadful day shall heaven and earth in ashes lay, as David and the Sibyl say. What did the Sibyl say? And why are they on the Sistine Chapel? It is because the Sibyls were said to have revealed the Christian God and prophesied Jesus. This is attested to by the Church Fathers. St. Clement of Alexandria, who died 215 AD, describes a Sibyl in chapter 8 of his Exhortation to the Heathens. Let the Sibyl prophetess, then, be the first to sing to us the song of salvation. So he is all sure and unerring. Come, follow no longer darkness and gloom. See the sun's sweet glancing light shines gloriously. Know and lay up wisdom in your hearts. There is one God who sends rains and winds and earthquakes, thunderbolts, famines, plagues, and dismal sorrows, and snows and ice, but why detail particulars? He reigns over heaven, he rules earth, he truly is. Where in remarkable accordance with inspiration, she compares delusion to darkness and the knowledge of God to the sun and light, and subjecting both to comparison, shows the choice we ought to make. For falsehood is not dissipated by the bare presentation of the truth, but by the practical improvement of the truth, it is ejected and put to flight.
the primary source today for the Sibyls are the Sibylline Oracles. This is a collection of prophecies attributed to the Sibyls. They are also our only surviving primary source of Sibylline prophecies, the others existing in tales and legends. The Sibylline Oracles are quoted by early Christians and the Church Fathers as authentic prophecies by the Sibyls. The compiled collection was preserved by the Christians. Many of the prophecies are clearly not authentic Sibylline prophecies. Rather, they are poems written in the style of a Sibylline prophecy. Thus, they are written by much later Christians, writing biblical narratives in the style of ancient Greek culture and prophecy and verse. Some may be authentic, though. Certainly, those quoted by the Church Fathers were thought to be authentic. The influence of the Sibyls was such that even the Didache is thought to be quoted in influencing them by some scholars. And this is something I want to talk about just a little bit. So sure. one of the things I found is that there is a scholar or two, I don't remember his name, but he he wrote a book on the influence of the Sibylline oracles on the Didache. The Didache is, I've heard it mentioned as the earliest extra-biblical writing. It, it was almost canon to the scripture because it's the teaching of the Twelve. So it's the teaching of the Twelve Disciples. This book that I found, unfortunately, I could not read it because this scholar who wrote it just assumes whoever is reading this book can read Greek. Right. Yeah. And didn't translate a single thing. Wow. And when he, I can tell what he was doing, though, was he was comparing lines in the Didache to the Sibylline Oracle, mm. essentially saying it's borrowed language. And whoever wrote the Didache was either quoting or borrowing from the Sibyls. It's a major influence. You, you get a lot of early church doctrine and teaching from the Didache and again just I mean it's like 60 AD or something like that that was written maybe earlier it's hard to find good scholarship on the Sibylline oracles but what I did find one of the main contentions that they had is these prophecies are too perfect which I'm just like well then it wouldn't be a prophecy, would it? <laughs> yeah, right? And you actually get the same thing with the Bible, with Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's a, really almost the entire reason you get these later dates for the Gospels, because they're saying, well, I mean, that's a perfect prophecy. Nobody could have known the temple was going to be destroyed, so obviously this was written after the temple was destroyed. You get kind of the same thing here, and it's one of those things where it's like, okay, but if they're speaking generally, then you'd say, oh, it's too general, it's not a real prophecy, but if they speak specific, then, oh, it's just a hoax, it's fake. Right, yeah. But a lot of these, actually, I would say, in the collection of the Sibylline Oracles, I don't even think they're trying to pretend to be authentic. Like, they, they're just, like, talking about the flood and then go into Moses and such, and it's... Biblical narrative written in ancient Greek style, which is really cool for those of us who love ancient Greek culture. Mm -hmm. But those are not authentic, but some of the ones we'll be reading here, the church fathers were quoting as authentic. A lot of them were quoting them to other pagans, heathens, contemporary with the time, in a way of saying, see, even the sibling oracles, they say this, and you know who these oracles are, and you know... You wouldn't be saying that if it was like a known hoax or something. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, again, I'm just fascinated by this. A Legend of the Tibertine Sibyl She lived in Tiber with a temple dedicated to her, surrounded by a grove and mineral springs that flowed into the Tiber River. She was worshipped as a goddess. In one legend, she was the daughter of Priam and Hecuba, the legendary last king and queen of Troy, making her the sister of the Trojan princess Hector and Paris and the cursed prophet Cassandra. The story recounted in Archbishop Jacobus de Vorgine's 13th century golden legend in its section on the Feast of the Nativity. Here is what Pope Innocent III tells us. In order to reward Octavian for having established peace 
in the world, the Senate wished to pay him the honors of a god. But the wise emperor, knowing that he was mortal, was unwilling to assume the title of immortal before he had asked the Sibyl whether the world would some day see the birth of a greater man than he. Now on the day of the Nativity, the Sibyl was alone with the emperor, when at high noon she saw a golden ring appear around the sun. In the middle of the circle stood a virgin of wondrous beauty, holding a child upon her bosom. The Sibyl showed this wonder to Caesar, and a voice was heard which said, This woman is the altar of heaven, Ara Coeli. And the Sibyl said to him, This child will be greater than thou. Thus the room where this miracle took place was consecrated to the Holy Virgin, and upon the site the church of Santa Maria in Ara Coeli stands today. However, other historians recount the same event in a slightly different way. According to them, Augustus mounted the capital and asked the gods to make known to him who would reign after him, and he heard a voice saying, A heavenly child, the son of the living God, born of a spotless virgin. Whereupon Augustus erected the altar beneath, which he placed the inscription, This is the altar of the son of the living God. In the prophecy of the tenth Sibyl, a Roman emperor summons her after one hundred senators had experienced the same dream on the same night. In this dream, nine different suns appeared in the sky. As to interpret the dream, the Tiburtine Sibyl explained that the suns represent nine future eras. She prophesied that one sun, which the senators described as having a blood-red color, signified an era in which the virgin named Mary would bear a child named Jesus, the Son of God. She also foretold that the last sun to appear in the dream, which had been very gloomy, represented the end time in which the Son of God would return for a final judgment over humankind. The prophecy of the tenth Sibyl concludes with a poem about the end of the world that contains a hidden reference to the birth of Christ and his return at the world's end. In the original Greek version of the poem, reading the first letter of each line downward spells the words, Yes, just Christus Theo Soter, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. Justin Martyr. He is the saint that I was confirmed under. Oh, perfect. Justin Martyr was someone even before I converted to Catholicism I knew about him I was always impressed by him and it was actually because of him that I converted Catholicism oh. because one of the main sticking points that I had like I could accept the stuff about the Marian dogmas but transubstantiation was something I just couldn't get my head around mm. and I was thinking to myself, this has got to be like a later invention or something. But St. Justin Martyr, in his works, he explicitly states that the bread is Jesus' flesh and that we eat it as Jesus' flesh. So he's very important to me. This particular writing here, so he does mention the Sibyls a few times, but this particular one here is considered not written by Justin, but rather like a contemporary or near contemporary using his name because he was someone very influential. Mm -hmm. It's considered not to have been written by him because some of the stuff that you read in this, it kind of contradicts just tomorrow. But this particular passage is useful because, again, you have somebody in the early church, I mean, this church father territory here, Justin Father is one of the church fathers, writing to the ancient Greeks, talking about the Sibyls, mentioning prophecies that they made. And, I mean, it's clearly not a later invention, at least not from this point on. And it's quote as authentic. It wasn't that uncommon a practice. You find this, uh, well, I mean, the golden legend, which we mentioned before, people would add to it under the name of Jacobus, even though it wasn't his original golden legend. And there's all these different versions of the golden legend. And it wasn't done in a way to be deceitful or 
anything like that. It was sort of more of a common practice back then for people to take up the pen of someone a little more famous and try to write in their style. Yeah, in this particular book here, um, The Address to the Greeks, what the scholars call him pseudo-Justin. What pseudo-Justin is doing is he's talking about a lot of ancient Greek beliefs and showing parallels to Jesus, or in this case, where they seem to be off them. Pseudo-Justin, he quotes from the Sibylline Oracles, which this is a surviving work. You can get copies of Sibylline Oracles today, and I recommend it. It's good reading. Pseudo Justin uses these quotes to show the Sibyls were speaking of the Christian God. He ascribes to the Sibyls divine prophetic power coming from God, citing Plato. We must also mention what the ancient and exceedingly remote Sibyl, whom Plato and Aristophanes and others besides, mentioned as a prophetess, taught you in her oracular verses concerning one only God, and she speaks thus. There is one only unbegotten God, omnipotent, invisible, most high, all-seeing, but himself seen by no flesh. Then elsewhere thus, But we have strayed from the immortal's ways, and worship with a dull and senseless mind, idols, the worksmanship of our own hands, and images and figures of dead men. And again, somewhere else, Blessed shall be those upon the earth who shall love the great God before all else, blessing him when they eat and when they drink, trusting it, this their piety alone, who shall observe all shrines which they may see, all altars and vain figures of dumb stones, worthless and stained with blood of animals, and sacrifice of the four food tribes, beholding the great glory of one God. These are the Sibyl's words. And you may, in part, easily learn the right religion from the ancient Sibyl, who by some kind of potent inspiration teaches you, through her oracular predictions, truths which seem to be much akin to the teaching of the prophets. She, they say, was of Babylonian extraction, being the daughter of Barosus, who wrote the Chaldean history, and when she had crossed over, how I know not, into the region of Campania, she there uttered her oracular sayings in a city called Cumae, six miles from Baiae, where the hot springs of Campania are found. And being in that city, we saw also a certain place in which we were shown a very large basilica cut out of one stone, a vast affair and worthy of all admiration. And they who had heard it from their fathers as part of their country's tradition told us that it was here she used to publish her oracles, and in the middle of the basilica they showed us three receptacles cut out of one stone, in which, when filled with water, they said that she washed, and having put on her robe again, retires into the inmost chamber of the basilica, which is still a part of the one stone, and sitting in the middle of the chamber on a high rostrum and throne, thus proclaims her oracles. And both by many other writers has the Sibyl been mentioned as a prophetess, and also by Plato and his Phaedrus. And Plato seems to have counted prophets divinely inspired when he read her prophecies, for he saw that what she had long ago predicted was accomplished, and on this account he expresses in the dialogue with Menno his wonder at and admiration of prophets in the following terms. Those whom we now call prophetic persons we should rightly name divine, and not least would we say that they are divine and are raised to the prophetic ecstasy by the inspiration and possession of God, when they correctly speak of many imp and important matters, and yet know nothing of what they are saying, plainly and manifestly referring to the prophecies of the Sibyl. For unlike the poets, who after their poems are penned, have power to correct and polish, especially in the way of increasing the accuracy of their verse, she was filled indeed with prophecy at the time of the inspiration, but as soon as the inspiration ceased, there ceased also the remembrance of all she had said. And this indeed was the cause why some only, and not all, the meters of the verses of the Sibyl were preserved. For we ourselves, when in that city, ascertained from our Cicerone, who showed us the places in which she used to prophecy, that there was a certain coffer made of brass in which they said that her remains were preserved. And besides all else which they told us as they had heard it from their fathers, 
They said also that they who then took down her prophecies, being illiterate persons, often went quite astray from the accuracy of the meters, and this, they said, was the cause of the want of meter in some of the verses. The prophetess, having no remembrance of what she had said after the possession and inspiration ceased, and the reporters having, through their lack of education, failed to record the meters with accuracy. And on this account it is manifest that Plato had an eye to the prophecies of the Sibyl when he said this about prophets. For he said, when they correctly speak of many and important matters, and yet know nothing of what they are saying. But since you men of Greece, the matters of the true religion lie not in the metrical numbers of poetry, nor yet in that culture which is highly esteemed among you, do you henceforward pay less devotion to accuracy of meters and of language, and give in heed without contentiousness to the words of the Sibyl, recognize how great are the benefits which she will confer upon you by predicting, as she does in a clear and patent manner, the advent of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. If, therefore, ye men of Greece, you do not esteem the false fancy concerning those that are no gods at a higher rate than your own salvation, believe, as I said, the most ancient and time-honored Sibyl, whose books are preserved in all the world, and who by some kind of potent inspiration both teaches us in her oracular utterances concerning those that are called gods and have no existence, and also clearly and manifestly prophecies concerning the predicted advent of our Savior Jesus Christ and concerning all those things which were to be done by him. St. Augustine quotes from one of the Sibylline oracles what is now known as the Sibyl of the Acrostic. Of the Eritrean Sibyl, who is known to have sung many things about Christ more plainly than the other Sibyls. This Sibyl of Eritrea certainly wrote some things concerning Christ which are quite manifest, and we first read them in the Latin tongue in verses of bad Latin and unrhythmical through the unskillfulness, as we afterwards learned, of some interpreter unknown to me. For Flacianus, a very famous man, who was also proconsul, a man of most ready eloquence and much learning, when we were speaking about Christ, produced a Greek manuscript, saying that it was the prophecies of the Eritrean Sibyl, in which he pointed out a certain passage which had the initial letters of the lines arranged that these words could be read in them. Jesus Christus Theo Ois Soter, which means Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. And these verses, of which the initial letters yield that meaning, contain what follows as translated by someone into Latin in good rhythm. Judgment shall moisten the earth with the sweat of its standard, ever enduring. Behold, the King shall come through the ages, sent to be here in the flesh, and judge at last the world. O God, the believing and faithless alike shall behold thee, uplifted with saints, when at last the ages are ended. Seated before him are souls in the flesh for his judgment. Hid in thick vapors, the while desolate lieth the earth, rejected by men are the idols and long-hidden treasures. Earth is consumed by fire, and it searcheth the ocean and heaven. Issuing forth, it destroyeth the terrible portals of hell. Saints in their body and soul, freedom and light shall inherit. Those who are guilty shall burn in fire and brimstone forever occult actions revealing, each one shall publish his secrets. Secrets of every man's heart God shall reveal in the light. Then shall be weeping and wailing, yea, and gnashing of teeth. Eclipsed is the sun, and silenced the stars in their course. Over and gone is the splendor of moonlight, melted the heaven. Uplifted by him are the valleys, and cast down are the mountains. Utterly gone among men are distinctions of lofty and lowly. Into the plains rush the hills, the skies and oceans are mingled. Oh, what an end of all things! Earth broken in pieces shall perish. Swelling together at once shall the waters and flames flow in rivers. Sounding the archangel's trumpet shall peal down from heaven over the wicked who groan in their guilt and their manifold sorrows. Trembling, the earth shall be opened, revealing chaos and hell. Every king before God shall stand in that day to be judged. 
rivers of fire and brimstone shall fall from the heaven. What the listener couldn't see as I read that is that indeed the first letter of every line spells out the Greek, which translates to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. Very, very interesting. In these Latin verses, the meaning of the Greek is correctly given, although not in the exact order of the lines as connected with the initial letters. For in three of them, the 5th, 18th, and 19th, where the Greek letter U occurs, Latin words could not be found beginning with the corresponding letter and yielding a suitable meaning. So that if we note down together the initial letters of all the lines in our Latin translation, except those three, which we retain the letter U in the proper place, they will express in five Greek words this meaning, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. And the verses are 27, which is the cube of three, for three times three are nine, and nine itself, if tripled, so as to rise from the superficial square to the cube, comes to 27. But if you join the initial letters of these five Greek words, which mean Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, they will make the word ictus, that is, fish, in which word Christ is mystically understood, because he was able to live, that is, to exist, without sin in the abyss of his mortality, as in the depth of water. But this Sibyl, whether she is the Eritrean, or as some rather believe, the Cumian, in her whole poem, of which this is a very small portion, not only has nothing that can relate to the worship of false or feigned gods, but rather speaks against them and their worshippers in such a way that we might even think she ought to be reckoned among those who belong to the city of God. Lactantius also inserted in his work the prophecies about Christ of a certain Sibyl. He does not say which, but I have thought fit to combine in a single extract, which may seem long, what he has set down in many short quotations. She says, Afterward he shall come into the injurious hands of the unbelieving, and they will give God buffets with profane hands, and with impure mouth will spit out envenomed spittle, but he will, with simplicity, yield his holy back to stripes, and he will hold his peace when struck with the fist, that no one may find out what word or whence he comes to speak to hell. And he shall be crowned with a crown of thorns, and they shall give him gall for meat and vinegar for his thirst. They will spread this table of inhospitality. For thou thyself, being foolish, hast not understood thy God deluding the minds of mortals, but hast both crowned him with thorns and mingled for him bitter gall. But the veil of the temple shall be rent, and at midday it shall be darker than night for three hours, and he shall die the death, taking sleep for three days, and then returning from hell, he first shall come to the light, the beginning of the resurrection being shown to the recalled. Lactantius made use of these sibling testimonies, introducing them bit by bit in the course of his discussion, as the things he intended to prove seemed to require, and we have set them down in one connected series, uninterrupted by comment, only taking care to mark them by capitals. Only the transcribers do not neglect to preserve them hereafter. Some writers, indeed, say that the Eritrean Sibyl was not in the time of Romulus, but of the Trojan War. Another prophet was said to have been Virgil, the ancient Roman poet, in his Ecologue, Book 4. He writes of a golden age to come that was in turn prophesied by the Cumian Sibyl. He speaks of a child, a son of Jupiter, who ushers in the golden age. There also appears to be a reference to a virgin woman. This prophecy is why Virgil is Dante's guide through hell. Virgil was considered to have been one of the enlightened and holy ancients, along with such as Plato and Socrates. Ecologue for the Golden Age. Muses of Sicily, let me sing a little more grandly. Orchards and humble tamarisks, don't please everyone. If I sing of the woods, let the woods be fit for a council. Now the last age of Cumian prophecy begins. The great roll call of the centuries is born anew. 
Now virgin justice returns and Saturn's reign. Now a new race descends from the heavens above. Only favor the child who's born, pure Lucina, under whom the first race of iron shall end, and a gold race rise up throughout the world. Now your Apollo reigns, for Pollio, in your consulship, this noble age begins, and the noble months begin their advance. Any traces of our evils that remain will be cancelled, while you lead and leave the earth free from perpetual fear. He will take on divine life, and he will see gods mingled with heroes, and be seen by them, and rule a peaceful world with his father's powers. And for you, boy, the uncultivated earth will pour out her first little gifts, straggling ivy and cyclamen everywhere, and the bean flower with the smiling acanthus. The goats will come home themselves, their udder swollen with milk, and the cattle will have no fear of fierce lions. Your cradle itself will pour out delightful flowers, and the snakes will die, and deceitful, poisonous herbs will wither. Assyrian spice plants will spring up everywhere, and you will read both of heroic glories and your father's deeds, and will soon know what virtue can be. The plain will slowly turn golden with tender wheat, and the ripe clusters hang on the wild briar. And the tough oak drip with dew-wet honey. Some small traces of ancient error will lurk that will command men to take to the sea in ships, encircle towns with walls, plow the earth with furrows. Another Argo will rise and carry chosen heroes, a second Typhus as helmsman. There will be another war, and great Achilles will be sent once more to Troy. Then, when the strength of age has made you a man, the merchant himself will quit the sea, nor will the pine ship trade its goods. Every land will produce everything. The soil will not feel the hoe, nor the vine the pruning hook. The strong plowman, too, will free his oxen from the yoke. Wool will no longer be taught to counterfeit varied colors. The ram in the meadow will change his fleece himself, now to a sweet blushing purple, now to a saffron yellow. Scarlet will clothe the browsing lambs of its own accord. Let such ages roll on, the fates said in harmony, to the spindle with the power of inexorable destiny. O oh, dear child of the gods, take up your high honors. The time is near, great son of Jupiter. See the world with its weighty dome, bowing, earth and wide sea and deep heavens. See how everything delights in the future age. O oh, let the last days of a long life remain to me and the inspiration to tell how great your deeds will be. Thracian Orpheus and Linus will not overcome me in song, though his mother helps the one, his father the other. Calliope, Orpheus, and lovely Apollo Linus, even Pan if he competed with me, with Arcadia's judge, even Pan with Arcadia's judge, would account himself beaten. Little child, begin to recognize your mother with a smile. Ten months have brought a mother's song to labor. Little child, begin. He on whom his parents do not smile, no god honors at his banquets, no goddess in her bed. These are the ancient Greek and Roman prophets of Christ. Today there is skepticism of the authenticity of the Sibylline oracles, and Virgil's poem is doubted. But the Sibylline oracles are thought to contain and be mixed with some authentic oracles. We simply don't know which. And we know the work to have influenced the early Christians and the church fathers who did view them as authentic. Regardless of whether that collection is authentic, the idea comes from something that may be real, that these ancient Greek prophets may have seen the coming Christ, and those words have lived forever or perhaps were prophesied by the Cumian Sibyl, written on leaves and scattered to the wind, to be lost forever. Well, as I said before, you know, it only takes one of them to be right. This is all new to me. I really love this, Justin. I, th I think this is a fantastic episode you put together. Thank you. Well, you do a lot more writing like this on your sub stack. So why don't you tell people about that? Yes, my sub stack is astrologyofthesaints.substack.com. I'm always writing there. I try to get something up every week and right now I'm looking into the Marian apparitions again so some of those will be up and I mean I always have like a half dozen articles in the works on there so something always pops up the latest one is 
on St. Bernadette's incorrupt body. And there are links to that in the show notes and in the about section at theflowerpath.com as well. We are actually recording this on the day of the Annunciation, and you have a little writing by St. Gemma Galgani on the Annunciation. Yes, this is something that is not available in other English translations of Gemma Galgani's letters. I mean, I haven't seen any. The one that I got is from a strange book that I found. There were only two copies available, and it appears to be a like machine translation of all of her writings and ecstasies. So I'm going to be reading it, but some of it might be a bit iffy with the translation, but most of it holds up. It was on the... Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, 1901, that she is writing this to Father Germanus, her spiritual advisor. Jesus made himself felt to my soul more than usual. I felt an internal recollection, which by the grace of God did not distract me from anything in the world. Around noon I hear my angel beat me over one shoulder and say, Gemma, I come on Jesus' side to fulfill his promise. I didn't know what to think. I marveled to hear these words. Daughter, he added, I am your guardian, sent by God. I come to make you understand a mystery greater than all other mysteries. My wonder became greater. I still did not understand. My angel noticed this and said to me, Do you remember twelve days back what I promised you? I thought and soon found myself. No, my daughter, that I will speak to you of Mary most holy, of a little girl so humble before the world, but of infinite greatness before God. I will speak to you of the most beautiful, the holiest of all creatures, of the beloved daughter of the Most High, of the one who was destined for the incomparable dignity of Mother of God. I prepared to listen to his words as best I could, and he added, Know, then, that four thousand years of mourning had already passed, and these all weighed on mankind, and Mary most holy, he had to, with the fruit of his spirit, vows bring liberation and salvation to all, as soon as my angel often repeated to me. My daughter, by the Divine Father, was decreed the great embarrassment to be sent to the humble Mary, he had to decree himself again the bearer of so much announcement, and for this reason one was chosen, which was closer to the throne of the highest, and this was the archangel Gabriel, which means fortress of God. Mary was therefore about to become the strong woman, a terrible woman to the powers of darkness, or how happy the angel must have been to have been chosen for such a sublime mystery, and to present himself as a messenger of such good news to that virgin who later greeted Queen of Paradise. It was already late at night, and Mary, she was alone in her room, she prayed, she was all raptured in God. Suddenly there was a great light in that miserable room, and the archangel, taken human form and surrounded by an infinite number of angels, goes close to Mary, reverent and majestic at the same time. He bows to her, smiles at her as a herald of good news, and with sweet words he says to her, Hail, O Mary, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. O beautiful, a great and sublime greeting, which on earth had never been heard, nor will ever be heard. Only an archangel who announced to the most exalted of all creatures the sublimity of such a great mystery could be worthy to utter such magnificent praise in so sublime words. Alone was worthy of being greeted with such sublime and superhuman accents, the august mother of the Son of God. As soon as the celestial archangel had pronounced this offspring, he fell silent, almost waiting for her to nod to explain her divine embassy. Mary, however, hearing this surprising greeting, was troubled. She was silent and thought, 
But do you believe, O oh my daughter, that the angels of paradise never descended to Mary? She enjoyed every moment the visit and their sweet conversations. And she feared illusion? Nay, not at never, because the signs that the divine messenger bore of him who had sent him were too clear. Yes, this was true, that the messengers of the heavenly court had never appeared to her with such splendor and such noble courtship. But this was not the reason for which the Virgin is troubled. She does not go to investigate in her mind the mysterious sense, but is troubled because she believes herself unworthy of the angelic greeting. Ah, my daughter, he repeated to me, if Mary had known how much her humility had pleased the Lord, she would not have considered herself unworthy of the obedience of an angel. Why is it that an angel of God calls me full of grace, while I recognize myself undeserving of every divine favor? Why is it that, Mary reasoned to herself, an angel of paradise calls me blessed among women, while well, I am among females the most useless, the vilest, the most abject. What mystery is hidden under the veil of such an exalted greeting? To the greeting of the angel, Mary had no answer given. Then Gabriel, to cease her fear, repeats, Do not be afraid, O Mary. You are the only one who has found grace before the highest. From this moment you will conceive in your womb a son, you will give him the name Jesus, and by all he will be called Son of the Highest. To him shall be given the throne of David, shall reign forever, and his kingdom shall never end. With these sublime words, the archangel explained his entire embassy to Mary. Hurrah, we cry out. Mary is now declared mother of the promised liberator, of the redeemer of the world, of the Son of God. Yes, Mary was the great virgin long awaited. That son had to be great, but the mother had to be sublime, too. That son was to be the son of the Most High, but Mary had to be relieved to the most intimate of relationship with the Most High, Trinity. The angel had now manifested to the Virgin the welcome of the great mission, that is, that she was to become mother of the Son of the Most High. But she, turning to the angel, spoke to him, How can this happen, keeping my virginal candor a little bit. It had already been predicted in Isaiah's prophecy, which said that Christ was to be born of the virgin mother. This she already knew, and still knew that Jesus was a lily, and the lily finds its pasture only among the lilies. And she understood well that the Son of God, taken from her human nature and from her being born, would not, in the smallest part, injure the virginal integrity. So that is Gemma's vision of the Annunciation. It's a shame we couldn't get it out on the Annunciation, but we are recording it on the date of the Annunciation. And as I mentioned to you in a message, we do meditate upon the Annunciation at least two times every week when we pray the Rosary. So I think it's timeless in as much as that. And it's timeless in as much as Mary's yes changed the world. Right. Just a reminder, everybody, if you like what you're hearing on The Flowered Path, you can subscribe wherever you're listening. That helps a lot. If you want to leave a nice review, that can help as well. We are asking that you subscribe on YouTube, even if you don't listen there. It's free. It doesn't cost anything, and it will help us out. You can always find us at thefloweredpath.com. Do have an Etsy shop. The shop name on Etsy is Lost Graves. There's a Flowered Path section there. I've been forgetting to mention, we do have Flowered Path logo t-shirts back in stock. They've been in stock for a while, and I keep forgetting to mention it on the show. I believe at this point we have all sizes small through 2X. So if you want a Flowered Path t-shirt, you can find it at Etsy, as well as Flowered Path stickers. The first issue of the zine of Catholic Ephemera I did, called Petals and Thorns. There's paracord rosaries there that are handmade. I think I'm mostly sold out at this point, but I will be making more soon and get them up there. Again, it's on Etsy. Shop name is Lost Grave. There's a section for the Flowered Path there. I will put links in the show notes to that as well. Justin, thanks so much for all of your research for this episode. Yes, thank you. And we'll be back soon with more.